Um, so yeah, we're welcoming you to uh, the Communicate session where we're going to reflect on the Festival of National Nature Reserves. Um, so we've got a little bit of uh, uh, inspiration for you with a few uh, sort of highlights and uh, kind of event case studies from the festival and a little bit of background to the festival um, and some reflections on our communications as well through the festival. Um, just to introduce myself, my name is Mike Downey and I'm Natural England's Principal Advisor for National Nature Reserves, leading our Connecting People with Nature work. Um, so I'll be providing a bit of background and reflections on the festival to start with, and then we've got some uh, fab presenters who will be uh, really bringing the festival to life uh, for you and sharing some of their own experiences of supporting and participating uh, in the festival. So um, I, I think that there should have been an opening poll um, just at the start of the session. So hopefully you've had a chance to complete that. Um, and also to note that hopefully there'll be a, a quick closing poll as well. Now, here we go. The poll has arrived. Um, so, yeah, if you can just take uh, one second to uh, answer the polls. And then, as I say, there's a closing poll at the end of the session, um, which would be really grateful if you can complete that as well before you go on to whatever you're doing next. Um, peel, please feel free to use the chat uh, and there's also a Q&A function um, to give us your thoughts or to ask any questions. Um, we will be running quite tight for time on this session, so um, if we don't quite have time within the session to respond to any of the chat or Q&As, uh, we'll definitely do our best to get back to you after the event. Um, so I'm going to now just share uh, my screen and uh, we've got a, a, a number of slides to run through. Um, to talk you through the festival and uh, some of our experiences and learning. So without further ado, hopefully, uh, hopefully you can all see the slideshow. So, um, so the Festival of National Nature Reserves, what was it and how did it come about? Uh, so first of all, a really brief bit of background to National Nature Reserves, uh, which are otherwise known as NNRs, for those who aren't familiar. Um, and National Nature Reserves are England's most important places for nature. And uh, as of today, there are 221 NNRs in England, because we're actually celebrating the declaration of the newest NNR, Wild Ennerdale in Cumbria, as we speak. And NNRs are managed by Natural England, which is who I work for, as well as a collective of over 60 different managing organisations. And they range from environmental NGOs to local authorities and also private landowners. So it's a really broad partnership. And NNRs are also part of the suite of statutory designations for niche conservation. So they're underpinned by legislation. Um, and the very first NNRs were actually declared in 1952. Um, so, more or less this time last year, we decided we'd like to mark the occasion of the 70th birthday of National Nature Reserves in some way, uh, and so the concept was born for a celebratory festival. We debated whether that should be a one day event or whether it might lend itself to maybe a week or a fortnight of celebrations. Um, but in the end, we concluded that we should have a whole summer, uh, a summer and more. Um, Coming on the back of COVID, as we were sort of last year, we felt that everyone was long overdue a bit of a bit of joy. So we committed to a five month festival period that ran from the 19th of May, which was the anniversary date of the first NNRs, um, through to the end of October. So we've only recently just finished the, um, the festival period. And as you can probably imagine, that was quite a party to get planned. And in all honesty, uh, we were working at pretty short notice. Um, so a key lesson for us to start with was plan well ahead for this kind of thing and probably give yourself a year rather than just a matter of two or three months to uh, to get things together uh, if you can. Um, the rapid turnaround in that kind of planning has probably been a slight limiting factor, I would say, honestly, in the breadth of participation that we've been able to support and achieve. Um, however, the five month festival period did give us ample opportunity for nature reserves around the country to get involved and to offer up their own event plans into the festival programme um, and for us to build in a whole range of narratives around nature recovery and nature connection into the festival communications. Um, 
the aim of the festival was to kind of make it as easy as possible for NNRs to participate in it. Uh, so we set some festival objectives. We recruited a festival coordinator, and I'd just like to give a big shout out to Jamie Neal, um, who was our festival coordinator and has definitely been the heart and soul of the organisation and the collaborative efforts. Um, and we set up a festival steering group and communications group, all with fantastic support uh, from uh, sort of Natural England colleagues of mine, uh, as well as DEFRA communication teams, uh, the National Trust and the Wildlife Trust as well as some of our key partners that were involved. Um, we established some basic festival web pages, so an online presence and an online events calendar. Uh, we had a festival brand designed, um, got some social media content developed. Uh, we offered nature connection training webinars for managers, events managers uh, and engagement staff. Uh, and we prepared all of that to get put all of that together into a festival toolkit, which sort of brought everything as a one stop shop for managers and partners to be able to understand how they could join in, participate in the party and how to support the communications for the festival of NNRs. Um, some events you'll see on this slide even had a birthday cake, but uh, I'm afraid I can't take the credit for that one. Um, but in particular, we made it a priority to invest a lot of effort, mainly through Jamie, in supporting communications across the partnership. So keeping in regular touch with all the NNR site managers, engagement, events and communications staff across 60 different organisations, um, because we really wanted to build that sense of each individual NNR being able to contribute to something bigger. So the whole being bigger than the sum of the parts. And that's a really important kind of underpinning uh, philosophy for, for the National Nature Reserve series. And so the Festival of National Nature Reserves was born. Um, now, as I said earlier, the Festival Events Programme has only just concluded at the end of October um, a couple of weeks ago. So we're now working our way through the evaluation and the, the kind of legacy phase. Um, but I'd just like to share a few early headlines from our summer of celebrations. Um, so the festival has seen 268 events take place for local communities and groups around the country. Um, 149 of those have been run by partners or, or kind of jointly between Natural England and partners. So a really good sort of collaborative effort across the bulk of the festival. Um, over 80 NNRs have participated in the festival around the country. That sort of ranges from Lindisfarne right up in the far, far northeast of Northumberland, uh, right down to the far southwest and the Lizard National Nature Reserve in Cornwall. We've had over 60 partner organisations uh, get involved. That's either uh, managing organisations, so, so partners that manage National Nature Reserves, but also partnering with other uh, community groups and, uh, and other sort of local partners uh, that have really led and supported our festival events. Um, so we've seen through that new collaborations and um, a new community relations forged. Uh, and we'll touch on that a little bit more in some of our highlight spots. You'll get to hear about some of that. Um, and we're currently writing up some good practice case studies uh, to share some of the learning and, and kind of promote a bit of new thinking, hopefully. Um, and and, and the, the idea of that is to enable more sites to deliver more engagement, uh, more inclusively and more easily in the future. Uh, and then we've also had um, over 10,000 unique views on the website and almost 6,000 users uh, on the festival web pages. And that was from a complete standing start. And it was a real risk for our project that we didn't have a platform um, actually to just point people towards. Um, so we've, we've been really pleased with the kind of uh, success of that platform to uh, connect people into the festival. Um, and our early indication estimates are that the festival is likely to have seen around 10,000 people attending events and activities, which, um, again, we're really pleased with. We didn't set specific targets on this. Um, we probably uh, would have been uh, cock a hoop uh, at the thought of, um, of a thought of those sort of outcomes. Um, and, and crucially, we've been able to put nature at the heart of the conversation and hence the invited to communicate conference. Um, so throughout the festival's key communications moments, uh, and, and we'll hear a bit more about the communications approaches and successes a little bit later. 
Um, but without further ado, what I'd like to do is introduce you to three events which will bring the festival to life and give you a feel for the fantastic range of local community engagement that's been delivered. So I'm going to hand over to Sarah Barfoot from the National Trust. Um, thank you, Sarah. Hello, everybody. So my name is Sarah Barfoot. Thank you, Mike. Um, I'm the Experience and Programme Manager for the Essex and Suffolk Countryside Portfolio. But today I'm going to talk about our wonderful Hatfield Forest National Nature Reserve, um, which is located near Stansted Airport, uh, near Essex, or in Essex. And um, it's a site of special scientific interest and was gifted to the National Trust in 1924. And really, it's been welcoming visitors in one way or another since the Middle Ages. Next slide, please. So as part of the um, National um, Nature Reserve Festival, uh, we were clear that we wanted to participate in our portfolio. This Hatful Forest is the only National Nature Reserve that we have. Um, and so we wanted to offer up um, our wellness season, which included forest bathing from Forest Clouds Nature Therapy and Deborah Braithwaite Sunrise Yoga. There was some hesitancy from us as we weren't sure whether our idea of a wellness season would be a good fit for the festival. How wrong could we have been? We wrongly assumed that probably bio blitzes and guided walks would be the more popular programming choices, but luckily for us, that wasn't the case. So we were keen to promote our well-being and nature connection experiences. Moving on to the next slide, um, we want to talk about that that moment when when we have high biodiversity sites, which play an important part in combating many mental health and wellbeing challenges, including nature deficit disorder. We hosted the wellness season through the summer holidays and it went really well with 50 people taking part in four sessions of forest bathing and 67 participating in sunrise yoga across six sessions, all of which had a mix of genders and ages. The sunset yoga sessions were then planned following the success of the others, but we found out that 5 p.m. in an autumn or early autumn is not a good time for our audience. They much prefer kind of seven o'clock in the morning. And whilst our yoga instructor brought warm blankets and hot water bottles, it really just was too cold. But it was important for us to give this a go and the festival really gave us that opportunity to try something a bit different to our earlier exa examples. Old growth forest, like Catfield Forest, provides a unique connection with nature, which can be covered by our nature connection pathways. If you're not familiar with those, there are five of them. Using your senses, tuning into nature through the senses, emotion, feeling alive through the emotions and feelings that nature can evoke and bring, Beauty, noticing nature's beauty itself. Our fourth pathway, meaning, bringing meaning to our lives in a broader sense. And the fifth pathway of compassion, caring and taking action for nature. Participating in our wellness sessions, forest bathing and yoga, gave people the opportunity to immerse themselves in the Hatfield Forest spirit of place, drawing on the mindfulness benefits its nature can provide and the area is under increasing planning and development pressure, as well as people's increasingly busy lives. So this, this moment that the festival enabled us to create really did add benefit. The current slide that you're looking at is some of the social media promotion that we did in order to work with um, the National Nature Reserve Festival and our own Marcoms channels. So we used the basics of on-site posters, our website and social media. Our Hatfield Forest NT Facebook page at the time had an overall reach of just over 8,000 and our highest reach for a post was just over 2,000 which was great and, and the kind of average reach was about 1.8, uh, sorry 1,821. These posts were also promoted across Instagram, but that pl platform doesn't perform as well for our event posts because you can't really create a, an active live link. However, what we did seem to need to do was look at the images that we were using. You'll notice that none of these images have people in them. 
And with the tightening of GDPR regulations in our own organization and in the law, we've been exploring how we can use different images that will market our events effectively, but not put people off. We were very cautious of promoting the wellness season with people images because it can be known to put people off as if they don't see someone like them in that image, they might wrongly assume that the event wasn't for them. And we certainly didn't want to do that under our everyone welcome strategy. So we decided to use evocative images of the forest, which would communicate the atmospheric surroundings in which they would be exploring these wellness practices. As the sun sets, if we move on to the next slide, please, Mike. The sun sets on the success of our 2022 wellness season and the National Nature Reserve Festival. We're already thinking about how this might flow through to our 2023 programme and beyond. It's been such a success, we want to build on it. There will likely be a repeat of forest bathing and yoga, but we're also exploring other possibilities, including breathwork. Do follow us on our social media, shameless plug, and check out our website if you live nearby and do come and join us next year. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand back to Mike. Um, fabulous. Thank you very much, Sarah. And um, yeah, what a brilliant series of events for, for people's well-being. Um, and I think a demonstration of just how valuable that kind of nature connection is for our health and wellness and, and the role that our nature reserves can play in connecting people uh, to nature in different ways. So, um, and, and also some really useful insights there, Sarah, thank you into your kind of communications approaches too. So, um, so definitely some valuable kind of learning on, on that front. Um, and I'd really like to take the opportunity just to thank National Trust at this point for being incredibly supportive and engaging with the NNR Festival, um, not only at the sort of several national nature serves that, that, that the Trust manages, but also in supporting and amplifying the, uh, the communications around the festival. So thank you. Uh, thank you again for that. Um, now it's time for uh, something completely different and um, a festival within a festival. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to my colleague Piers Griffin from our Kent National Nature Reserves. Um, so take it away, Piers. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, hello, I'm Piers Griffin, uh, the Reserve Manager for Ham Street Woods NNR in Kent. And I'm going to talk to you about a music event we had this summer called Folk in the Woods. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so Ham Street Woods NNR was designated in the original suite of NNRs in 1952, and it was designated for woodland breeding birds, invertebrates, uh, woodland trees and flora, some of those pictures here. Celebrate the site being one of the first um, and getting to the grand old age of 70. I want to do something a bit different um, for the festival of NNRs this year. Uh, we put on four events over the summer, two at YNNR. Uh, a meet the moth day for the black vein moth, a guided walk about the floor and the landscape. At Ham Street, we had a 24 hour bio blitz in June. And then, but the main event uh, was our folk in the woods, which we put on on Sunday, the 4th of September. I was really excited about this. Um, wanted to bring my two passions of music and the NNR together. And I wanted to give the local people and the volunteers a good time. Um, the woods is bounded to the south by the village of Ham Street and is accessible by rail and road. Many people in the village use the site for recreation and dog walking, but there are also those who don't. And I wanted the event to draw in as many people and families from the local community as possible. I wanted, to encourage, I wanted it to be free to encourage people to engage and experience the woods in a different way. And I wanted as good as possible access for people with poor mobility. Um, so we set up about 100 metres from the entrance and had good vehicle access for people that needed it. Um, also, I wanted it to celebrate our hardworking volunteers and to invite members of staff from the local Natural England office as well. The main event, through local connections, I was recommended a fantastic folk band called Swing the Bridge, a local Kentish based band who play Kayleys and other parties, they play festivals and all kinds of gigs throughout the UK. And after a conversation, we decided to have an afternoon gig. Um, it would suit the location much better. So the practicalities of the event, um, to set up the event, we needed to, we, we, we funded it through our voluntary pay, 
parking payment scheme through Ringo, and it cost us about £750. And through staff time, we had about one day organising, a day of running the event, and volunteer time, we had a couple of volunteers, about half a day. Um, we needed triple SI consent for the event, risk assessments, of course, um, and we needed to consider the access for people mobility issues, organising toilets, setting up the badge bunting and flags, which you can see in the pictures. Um, we had to cut back the rides, um, clearing litter from the site and hazards, marking up hazards, moving the band's kit generator and litter bags and clearing the site during and after the event as well. Um, next slide. What was what was the day like? I wanted to, people to walk through the gate and through the trees um, along the rides before discovering the event in the clearing in the woods. On the day, it was a glorious sunny day, not a cloud in the sky. In fact, believe it or not, it was too hot at times. Over the afternoon, around 70 people joined us for the music. Some stayed for an hour, others stayed all afternoon. Some just dropped by. We had families with their children, any Natural England volunteers, couples with a glass of wine, groups of friends, dogs even brought their owners. We were also joined by the members of the Ashford Community Folk Group and they got involved with the music, brought, brought out their instruments and joined in with the many of the tunes. We had some dancing and some joining in with the songs. The atmosphere was very relaxed and jovial. One ingenious group of friends brought along their picnic uh, and wine using a wheelbarrow and then turned it over and used it as a table. What did the event mean to everybody? I had a chance to speak to almost everyone and they all said how they were enjoying the day, a chance to come and experience the woods in a different way. Um, it was a great celebration of the NNR and for our volunteers to just come and socialise. After the event, many people asked, will we be doing it again? Maybe another style of music, blues, swing, jazz. Next time, um, we, we were asked by the band, would we consider having some sort of mini festival as well? <laughs> um, and a few lessons learned really is I, I feel like I could have advertised better um, maybe earlier. We deliberately didn't do a big advertising campaign because of lack of parking. Um, and I wanted just to encourage the local uh, community. Um, maybe, maybe like I said, different music, maybe next time. But finally, would I do it again? Yes, please. But can we organise the weather? Thank you, everyone, for listening. And I'll hand you back over to Mike. Brilliant. Thank you, Piers. And let's just see if this works a second. Yay. Um, brilliant. Thank you, Piers. And um, yeah, I, I just described that as a really nice gift to the local community. I think what you've done at Ham Street Woods this summer uh, event that's really brought people together. Uh, really nice vibe. And it's sort of no hidden agenda. Like, you know, there's sort of no hidden agenda other than just to celebrate the National Nature Serve and, and kind of give something back. Oh, apologies. My slides have uh, uh, taken, a, 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 taken on a life of their own. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, just um, giving something back to the community. And I'm certain that that will benefit back into the night to the nature reserve as well, because, you know, the community will build that sort of sense of community belonging and value around the NNR. So um, we're going to move on now to our third and, and sort of final events highlight. So uh, this is an event that I had the absolute pleasure to attend just a few weeks ago um, at Ainsdale Sand Dunes. Um, it was a really special day. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Danielle Walsh, uh, to introduce herself. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Um, hi, everyone. So my name is Danielle Walsh and I am the Health and Environment Lead for the North West and I work for Natural England. Um, I'm here to talk to you about Ainsdale Sand Dunes NNR celebration event. Um, and what you'll see on the screen is a bit of a rolling slideshow of pictures from the day. So the NNR celebration event was such a lovely mix of bringing around 70 old and new faces into the same nat national, uh, natural green space and making everyone feel really comfortable and at home in their surroundings. It was named a sip and sing day, I have to try and get that right, um, where through the medium of music and a nice cuppa, uh, people including uh, the Natural England staff, external partners such as the RSPB, volunteers, and a choir called the Choir With No Name, could enjoy and be immersed in the beauty that the NNR has to offer. And you can see them on screen now. The day was totally joyous and was deeply rooted in celebrating the hard work the volunteers who devote 
so much of their time to the NNR um, to make it as special as it is. The volunteers and the choir were treated as special guests, as they should be, um, and both played a huge part in adding enormous heart and warmth uh, to a glorious day in the sunshine, um, in the October, October sunshine, should I say. Uh, the day began with a short intro into why the NNR is so special by Dave, the Senior Reserve Manager, and then Mike actually gave us a little bit of a history on the NNRs to the present day. And then attendees were then offered to take part in one morning activity, uh, which the choice consisted of a guiding walking tour of the NNR, a nature photography masterclass, which involved walking as well, and then lastly, a nature art masterclass, which was a static um, class and it let the participants sit and draw using their surroundings as inspiration. During the lunch break where everyone tucked into a really warm hearty meal, everyone mingled and chatted and really had the, the warmth of the sun on our backs as I said and there was even a teepee set up um, which had a campfire to roast marshmallows on. Um, and for the finale, the choir with no names debut performance was born, which really lifted everyone. And it was a lovely treat uh, for the volunteers to feel that something had been organised in recognition of their efforts. Um, and this was all achieved on a 2K budget, which included the art and photography uh, class fees, uh, the, twa the choir travel expenses, refreshments, snacks, um, all the cutlery needed, uh, decomposable, obviously, and then a hot two course lunch as well. And how the steak how this idea came to mind was through um, external networking and webinars and signposting work that I do alongside the National Academy for Social Prescribing, also called NASP. They have a Learning Together program in the Northwest. Um, so I met Emma, the choir manager, through a Learning Together session breakout room for Merseyside where green social prescribing was being discussed. Uh, a little background on the choir. The Choir With No Name is a charity that runs across the country and is centered around really welcoming people who may have experienced homelessness or other difficulties in life, including mental health illness and the general struggles that lots of us face in the world, especially this world that we live in. The choir meet every week to sing, rehearse upcoming gigs, um, chat, um, have a laugh, and really more importantly, to eat a hot meal together, which is always um, prepared for by their dedicated volunteers. Uh, the, the performances they do are empowering to those involved. However, the real joy does go, go beyond the stage that they share. It's about experiencing these opportunities together as a group and spending quality time with others who have possibly lived or felt what they have felt at one time or another. And it is through the sharing of time that the choir becomes more like an extended family or maybe the only family that some members have. And this is a really, this fits really well with Na Natural England's priorities to connect and engage people, especially underrepresented groups with nature. I knew that Emma and the choir were a great fit through the diversity and complexity of needs that the choir helps. Groups of people, including those who have suffered from homelessness, can often feel that they are the group that society have forgotten about. They certainly have not had it easy. And although connecting to nature will and may always be very low on their priority list, um, I and my co colleagues felt that it was the right opportunity, opportunity to invite uh, the group uh, made up of all ages, ethnicities and backgrounds to the wonderful NNR. The aim of the day was to provide an inclusive opportunity to let them see how nature could possibly provide that much needed space for thought, reflection and some peace away from everyday struggles, even if it was only for that short while. So the day was so much more than I expected. The time allowed for those organic conversations, old and new, blending together, lots of conversations and questions being asked about the space that we sat in and hearing the local knowledge of the volunteers shine through and inspire those less familiar was a real treat, especially when they were talking about trees, birds, natterjack toads, um, so much more. Um, so this slide that we're on now, um, really to capture the day, we to capture what the day had meant to people, we decided that a less um, quantitative approach was needed. Uh, therefore, we only asked attendees to score how happy they felt on a scale of zero to 10 on arrival and when leaving. And seeing that it was a Saturday, the sun was shining uh, through the trees. We actually had really high scores at the beginning of the day, um, but we still noted um, a 30% uplift um, in happiness from start to finish, which was great. Uh, we also asked attendees if they could write down one word or a phrase that summed up the day for them. It could be an observation or the way it made them feel. So now on screen, you will see the word cloud, which summarizes those words most used, such as inclusive, uplifting, if we just go back, yeah, uh, inclusive, uplifting, heart, magic, nurturing, happy and enlightening uh, uh, among other words. And you'll see there 
in really small writing the word boss, which is a really good word if you're from Merseyside. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, other phrases included inspired to get out more and learn about nature, as well as lifted to the treetops, which is one of my absolute favourites. I'm, I'm so happy that I was involved in an event that made somebody feel like that. Uh, and this feedback really aligns with Natural England's priorities, as mentioned earlier, to tackle barriers to nature. Uh, so by providing transport on the day for the choir, which is one of the biggest barriers that most people face, we feel that we've helped achieve that special initial encounter with nature for some of those by making it free and easy for them to get there in order to create that unforgettable first time experience in a quality natural setting such as an NNR which for some will be their one and maybe only experience which will leave them with a great memory for life or hopefully something more lasting can happen as a result from sparking that interest in that first visit which could lead to more people starting to use nature as a way of looking after their mental and physical well-being in addition to maybe even thinking of the green sector uh, for prospective jobs and using volunteering maybe opportunities to gain new skills to help achieve this. Next slide. So on screen, you can see that there has been some research carried out which evidences the positive impact, even just one intense experience in nature can have on a person, which goes as far as helping to change a person's worldview. It was evidence that these worldview adaptations can lead to changes in behavior and habit habits including going for a new job, weight loss, and even pursuing new projects. Um, so I suppose before I leave you with a clip of one of the many songs that the choir performed on the day to finish, um, here are my top tips that I have learned from hosting this event. So next slide, please. Uh, top tips would be know your audience. Uh, knowing your audience will allow you to arrange an event that is bespoke to those attending and ultimately more make it more memorable. So Northerners like a good brew and a cuppa, so we made sure we had lots of that. Um, but also I made sure to engage with the choir uh, manager, Emma, before um, they came to know what the, you know, see what the interests were from the choir. And uh, I, from those conversations, I, I had heard that they'd love trees. Um, and there was a, a bit of a joke between the group that they loved to hug trees and they took pictures wherever they went. So I made sure to pass that information on to the, the people who were doing the um, guided walking tour so that they would give them some more information. Uh, don't overpack the day. Please leave lots of time for downtime, a long lunch for people to really take in their surroundings in their own way. And also just to chat to new friends or old friends. And then lastly, do offer a variety. This means offer a variety of activities which cater for those uh, mobile or less mobile, even down to a, a variety of food. Uh, ensure everyone feels that there is enough on offer for them, whatever their dietary requirements are. So don't let one group feel that they're being less well catered for um, because there are fewer of them. And that was a top tip that Emma gave me as well about food insecurity. Um, so that was a, a really good tip. And that's it from me. Uh, I'll leave you with a little slide from the brilliant choir with no name. Thank you. Thank you. I'm back to Mike. Brilliant. Um, boss, thank you, Danielle. Uh, a really insightful presentation, actually, not just about the event, but about that kind of wider benefits of what you've worked so hard to to kind of put together at Ainsdale, um, you know, both in recognition of the incredible work of the volunteers on the National Nature Reserve, but also to connect with that marginalised and often, you know, often excluded community um, through partnering with partnering with choir with no name. Uh, and my experience of attending that event really was just like all those words that, you know, on your that your slide described, uplifting, emotional, joyful, you know, full of just really 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 lovely people who are genuinely grateful to have been treated to the day um 
And, and just for, for anyone who's um, on this session, you know, I'd really recommend if you're involved in community engagement and outreach um, to seek out the choir with no name if they're in your area. So see if you can offer something to support their cause and their community. Um, they've got groups, I think, at the moment in Liverpool, London, Birmingham, Brighton and Cardiff. Um, Right, so I'm going to move on to our final presenter um, and Stephen Gladhill uh, from our communications team in DEFRA. So Stephen's going to give us a bit of insight into the approaches and successes of communications that have flowed from the festival. So over to you, Stephen. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. I'll just get my presentation up and running. Okay, so, right, uh, so hello, uh, I'm Stephen Gladshill and I work in Natural England's external communications team and I lead on NNR uh, communications amongst other things. I'm going to talk very briefly about the communications, uh, planning and outputs, evaluation and shared benefits that we've enjoyed throughout the festival. My slides uh, are on a sort of carousel and uh, there's sort of images taken during the launch of the Festival of National Nature Reserves at the Somerset Wetlands NNR Declaration event on the 18th of May this year. And there'll also be a couple of slides on communications tools and outtakes. Um, you won't have to look at my beardy face while I'm talking uh, uh, and, and while you're listening. Um, planning the festival was something, you know, pretty ambitious really. It's one of the largest Natural England communications exercises undertaken to date in terms of the length of the, the program. Uh, because of this ambition, uh, we had to have some really great planning uh, at the core of our communications, and we had to ensure that we were super organized due to the number of participating national nature reserves, the number of partners, and the number of potential events. Uh, at the start, we didn't know how many there were going to be. And understanding the scale of the task, we decided to take a campaigns approach uh, to our communications. This meant that we needed to produce communications materials that could be rolled out to participating NNRs and partners at a national and local level to ensure consistency of messaging and approach, helping the festival to land um, as a coherent national series of local events with a deliberate read across from one event to another and um, with an aspiration, as Mike said earlier, that the whole would be greater than the sum of the parts. Another central element to our plans was to support our objective around inclusion. And we produced a comprehensive uh, audience segmentation at the beginning in our planning to ensure that we extended our reach way beyond the usual suspects and really penetrated new and different spaces. Um, one example of this was Marion Spain, who, who's the chief executive of Natural England. We organized a proactive interview with Practical Caravan, which is a great example of, of reaching new and important audiences that we perhaps wouldn't have thought of before. The case studies you've just heard about in, in the last three um, sessions um, sort of illustrate beautifully how, uh, you know, so, some of the, the fantastic successes we had around inclusion and different audiences. As already mentioned, uh, the production of the festival toolkit was central to our plans to deliver consistency and to support uh, participating uh, NNR teams that were organizing events and included things like key messages, identity, brand materials, uh, media advice and support, social media hash hashtags and ideas, uh, as well as uh, um, some links and so on to, to the website and various other supportive materials. In terms of our communications, we made a decision that we would allow event organizers to manage their own communications according to the resource they had on the ground, but offered support centrally if they needed it. Partners and approved bodies um, were pivotal in supporting communications locally, and I think you've already seen that for, from the, the previous examples. However, we also felt that we would support some of the larger events that had national significance and would hook into national narratives, such as delivering nature on a landscape scale, nature recovery network, nature-based solutions, connecting people with nature and so on. Some of these big sort of ticket messages that we wanted to get across. Three such events, all of which were 
uh, NNR declarations and not necessarily public facing, were the Somerset Wetlands NNR, which is the one that's in the earlier pictures, the Kinder Scout NNR declaration, which was managed by the National Trust and led by them, most recently the Flashes of Wigan and Lee National Nature Reserve declaration. You might have seen or read about some of these uh, on the news um, and some other sort of nationally significant events that we also supported. Um, men, Mike's already uh, mentioned the uh, Wild Ennerdale NNR, which was declared this morning. Um, uh, purely coincidental that it coincides with today's uh, um, conference. Taking a quick look at uh, evaluation, um, other than the key metrics, and I could run off a whole ton of numbers and statistics around uh, views or, or articles and so on, um, but it's really difficult actually to evaluate without spending loads of money, as many of you will already know, uh, what effect our communications had overall. We can be sure, um, however, that by taking this campaign approach, we gained much more traction with our communications than we would have done if the events had been held in complete isolation. We've also created a look and feel and an identity and a sense of collective that would have long lasting benefits, but again, are rather difficult to evaluate from a communications perspective. We will have a much better idea of the overall impact of the festival when our evaluation is completed, and Mike may tell you a little bit more about that at the end. So finally, I'd like to talk about some of the benefits of our communication experience over the last six months. In fact, it's been more than six months. Um, working in teams with a strong sense of governance and direction and clarity of purpose has been indispensable, and without which attempting to communicate on this scale would have been absolutely impossible. Um, I think another sort of really key point is that, and this might be sort of familiar to uh, communicate regulars, was the huge value of the chief executive and the chair buying in and supporting the um, Festival of NNRs from the start. Um, they were very much backing it and, and incredibly supportive. The willingness to put communications at the heart of the project from day one was so important, not just with Natural England, but also with our key partners the National Trust and the Wildlife Trusts in particular. It created a sense of togetherness and inclusion that overcame any sensitivities or complications uh, that might have arisen. And the communications partnership and cooperation was a huge success from the start. As part of these partnerships at both local and national levels, new and strong working relationships have been developed between organizational communications folk, which will make working together not just a possibility, but a probability uh, in the future. Throughout the summer, we've developed communications learning and experience at a local and national scale, which can be drawn upon in the future. We also have approaches and assets that can be adapted for further NNR festival activities, such as what we do about next year, for example. My top takeaway from this huge and enjoyable effort has been the sense of creating something big, something that NNR teams have been able to align with and rally behind and as a consequence, build the public understanding of what NNRs are and what they have to e offer each and every one of us in our own way. This is not the end. On the contrary, on the contrary um, we now have the foundations of a widespread communications partnership and approach and are ready to build on it in new and creative ways. And uh, I'll finish there. Thank you. Over back to you, Mike. Mute. Thank you, Stephen. Brilliant. Um, a really great rattle through the communications. I'm going to just finish. I've got about 30 seconds on next year. So next year, we're hoping to set up a National Nature Reserves Week, which is our legacy from the festival. So that was an annual part of that kind of calendar of celebrating nature. So National Nature Reserves Week, look out for it. Um, last week of May, I think, I think is where we're heading. If you'd like to help us do nature differently at our most important places for nature create and support inspirational experiences and collaborate around our national nature reserves then we would love to hear from you um, i hope you've enjoyed the session today and i hope that you can um, just spend 
10 seconds with our closing poll um, to let us know if you would like to get involved in any future community engagement or communications work with National Nature Serves. Um, again, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, and you can get in touch with us at nnrfestival at naturalengland.org.uk. Uh, we would love to hear from you uh, and really sort of extend the benefits into the future from um, a sort of future campaign and festival around National Nature Reserves. So I hope that you found a bit of inspiration and interest in the session today. Um, really thank you all for joining and for listening. Um, and I hope that you all enjoy the rest of communicate conference um thank you to our speakers as well um and we will close the session there thank you everybody <laughs>